<laughs> well, welcome everyone. I'm so glad that you're here. Um, today, I, on your behalf, after this service, I'm going to go down to Mexico. We're dedicating the community center that we've been building. Lots of you physically have been building it. Lots of you have been giving to make it happen. So we're going to have that great space down there uh, dedicated. So if you would, grab your Bibles and your outlines. We've got a great message for you today. I love adventure, and when I was in college, I took a series of rock climbing classes, the kind of beginner, intermediate, and then advanced. And in each one, it was, at each level, became more and more exciting. But the most fun part was learning to ultimately repel. You know, you'd learn in the beginning parts, you know, all the different things, and you'd climb, but you wouldn't get too high up. And the intermediate, okay. But in the final one, you really got to get to some pretty high places and do some pretty complicated climbs. But rappelling off of it was one of the most exciting things. I remember the first time I rappelled, it was a 130 feet cliff, because that's as long as the rope is. And then what you do is in, you had to have this moment. You've done all this training. You've learned different things, different levels. But at this point, you're up really high. When you're at 130 feet, it's pretty scenic. You can see a long way. And the cliff is pretty nasty. And it was one of those where you go off of it, but then it was like a spider where you just come down and not touch anything, which made it even more exciting. But there's this moment when you're rappelling where you have to lean out against the rope. The instructors taught you everything that they know, and they can't teach you anymore, and now you just have to lean against the rope. And I can remember, you know, you believe the rope will hold you, but now you're all in, and you've got to lean. And right at the point when you start to lean against the rope, because you have to really push hard against it, your brain is saying, don't do this. Stop. Get back on the rock. Where are you going? Everything's going to go bad. Don't do this. But if you're pushed back over it, and then you get you know, kind of where you need to be, then you can drop down and then go down. And it was one of the best and funnest things I ever did was just learning to repel and, and do this. But you had to get through that moment. And that's what I want to talk to you about today. These moments in our life that we all get to, where we believe something that's true about God, but we're pushed into a moment where everything in us is saying, don't do this, step back, go to safety. And God's saying, I want you to trust me, I want you to lean back and trust what I've said, trust a promise, I want you to step out in faith, and it's a very challenging moment. These are moments of faith, where you have to say, God, I'm going to take you at your word. So what we're doing in this series is talking about the beginning point of faith. Where does faith have its beginning point? In everyone's life, it's got some kind of a beginning point. For some of us, we were, you know, we grew up and our parents told us about God and he was good and loving. Or maybe you went to some kind of church or a temple or synagogue or a mosque and you learned some things about God. And you had kind of a childish view of God. And as you grew older, you ran into some adult problems, some adult questions. And those adult problems and questions couldn't be answered with your childhood faith. And for some of you, it just cracked your foundation of belief. It wasn't that you were angry at God or even angry at the church. You just kind of walked away because it just didn't matter. You weren't sure exactly what you believed. And so you just kind of drifted from it. And the question that... I think needs to be asked is what is the true beginning point if you wanted to restart your faith or if you have no faith you want to start it from the beginning point or you've lost it and you want to restart it or if you want to take your next step what is the essence the beginning point of faith for anyone who is a christian there's just one answer for that i'm going to ask you the question the right answer is jesus be ready for it Christians would say, you ask any Christian, you say, what's the beginning point of faith? Everyone would say, Jesus, Jesus is. And so that's what we were, we're talking about, is who is Jesus? And is he reliable? So we're looking at the book of Luke. Luke is this wonderful book that's unique. We're going to talk about that today. Remember that Luke wrote most of the New Testament by quantity of verses. He wrote the Gospel of Luke and the book of Acts. Paul wrote more letters in the New Testament, but Luke, by volume or number of verses, actually wrote more of the New Testament than any other writer. So we're looking at the book that he wrote. And I'm going to read to you the first four verses. So if you've got a Bible, turn to Luke. If you've got a paper Bible, like the one Jesus had. <laughs> or if you've got a technology, either one's fine, really. Mark Luke. And what we're going to do is we're going to uh, read the first verses in Luke. And what I want to do is ask you this question. When I read this to you, does this sound like a fairy tale? Does it sound like, you know, once upon a time or long, long ago in a galaxy far, far away? 
Or does it read like religious stuff? You know, just as soon as you read it, you go, this is just religious things that religious people write. Or does it read like history? Is this just history? Somebody stating the facts of what happened. So let's look at it. It's on the screen. You've got a Bible. You tell me, what is this, right? Many have undertaken to draw up an account of the things that have been fulfilled among us, just as they were handed down to us by those who from the first were eyewitnesses and servants of the word. With this in mind, since I myself have carefully investigated everything from the beginning, I too decided to write an orderly account for you, most excellent Theophilus, so that you may know the certainty of the things that you have been taught. All right, how many, sounds like fairy tale? Sounds like religious jargon? Okay, sounds like history, right? This is a historical account. The person that's writing clearly is saying, this is an historical account, and I'm going to give you the facts. Now, when we read the Bible, remember, the Bible technically is not a book. It's not really even a book of books. It's a book of ancient manuscripts uh, that, were, that are kind of, in the Bible, is kind of a binder for a bunch of ancient manuscripts. It's written by people, but we believe inspired by God. And there are four biographies about Jesus's life. And they are Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. So we're going to look at Luke. And what I love about Luke is as Luke is writing this account, he's writing from an outsider's perspective, which means this. Luke wasn't an eyewitness to any of the accounts that he's there. He wasn't there. He wasn't even a Jew. He didn't grow up in the Jewish culture. He didn't grow up with the working knowledge of the Old Testament. He grew up in a different country, had a different background. So when he writes this, He's going and he talks to eyewitnesses and he's saying, now tell me what he said. Why would that have been important to you? And what I love is he's writing, he's researching it from an outsider's perspective. When, you know, Jesus, he's writing in the early 60s. Jesus lived in the 30s, died about 33 AD, was buried, and then rose from the dead in 33 AD. The church burst onto the scene and Peter, in the very first message to people, said, Jesus, who you killed, has risen from the dead. And he is the author of life. He's conquered death. You don't have to fear it anymore. And there's forgiveness and life for everyone. And that was startling because the Old Testament seemed like a Jewish book. Even though it was written for everyone, it seemed the Jews kind of made it all about them. And so all of a sudden, for Jesus, who was a Jew, talking about a Jewish Messiah, really is it for everyone? And the surprise is that it really was for everyone. And as a church exploded across the landscape of the world, it was literally for everyone. There were Greeks and Romans and Asians and Africans and some Jews that joined the church. But the majority of people that became a part of the church in the very first years were not Jewish people, which are called Gentiles in the Bible. Anybody that's not a Jew is a Gentile. That would be most of all of us. And so he's saying, it's for everyone. And Luke can't get over this idea. It's for me. He became an early convert. He actually talked with a lot of these eyewitness people. But he felt like an outsider. He, can Jesus really be for me? And what I love is that's for any of us. Luke is a book that's written for all of us that feel like we're outsiders. I didn't grow up as a Jew. I wasn't in a Jewish culture. I mean, you know, when I first became a Christian, I didn't have a real good working knowledge of the Old Testament. And maybe you feel that way too. It's like, well, I'm not sure. And how do I fit in this? Maybe you think that you have to be a good person, a really good person. And so you feel an outside, as, as an outsider. Maybe it's because you come to church and you go, look at all these people. I'm not sure I'm like them. Do I really fit? Do I belong in God's family, the people of God? If you have ever felt like an outsider, or even as you read the Bible. You're not sure because it doesn't make sense. You're going to love the book of Luke because he wrote from an outsider's perspective. He gave us this unique kind of uh, a different view. So as we look at that, that's part of what you'll see. He, he asked a lot of kinds of, he asked a number of questions that you would ask from an outsider. And so we gave you this card. One of the things that I hope you will do is I'll bet you know somebody who feels like an outsider. And you go, you know what? At my church, we're going through the gospel of Luke. It's a story told by an outsider, somebody who, you know, looks at it from that perspective. I think you might like understanding who Jesus is from an outsider's perspective. Give it to them. All right. Now, look at what he says. He starts off and he says, many have undertaken to draw up an account of these things that have been fulfilled among us. 
Luke is aware there's other people who have written gospel accounts. Clearly, he has read Mark's account, but he says, I understand other people have done research and they've written an account. And he says, and about things that have been fulfilled among us. He's helping us understand that what God was doing before Jesus is now just being completed in Jesus. It's not a new thing. It did start in the Old Testament, but the things that were promised in the Old Testament now are being fulfilled uh, in Jesus's life. And it's among us. It didn't happen in a corner. This actually happened right out in front where people could see. And so he says, I did my research and I talked to eyewitnesses. And at this time, you know, by 60 AD or later, uh, Luke would have had to travel to different countries around the Mediterranean to even find these different eyewitnesses. And he did. He says, I went and I talked to them. And he has that unique outsider's perspective. What did Jesus do? When he said that, why was that important? What does that mean? And he'll reveal a lot of that as we look at this gospel account. And then he says, I decided to write an orderly account to you, most excellent Theophilus. Now what's interesting is in, in, uh, in the first century when somebody would write a history and write an orderly account, that's not necessarily a chronological account. That's just not the way they did history back then. They would get all the facts together and they would present history in, a, in what they would say is an orderly way, but not necessarily chronological. And maybe when you were in college, you had a university a professor say to you, you can't trust the Bible because the Bible has lots of contradictions. And probably the contradictions they identified, if they bothered to do that, would have been in the gospel accounts. They would have said, look at this guy. He says, look at, he lists the temptations of Jesus and the first one, second one, and third one. And then when Luke lists the temptations, they're in a different order. So they, they don't go together. But what you need to understand in the first century that's not the way historians write. The purpose wouldn't have been to say which was first, second, and third. They simply would have said, there was this temptation, here's how it went, but the order wouldn't have been important. Nobody in the first century would have thought that's important. And even today, when you read some histories, they don't list them necessarily chronological. If you read the book 1776, it's a wonderful history of that year, but it's not literally chronological. They tell part of the story, then it goes back and tells a different part of the story and different. And we like that. We understand that that's what they do. And so it's not that there's, uh, there's not contradictions. It's just not the way they wrote history. So he said, I got all this information together. I sat down and I talked with eyewitnesses. I carefully researched it. I started from the beginning. I got all of this research together and I wrote an orderly account about this. And the reason that he did it, the orderly account, is so he says, so that you would know the certainty of what you have been taught, most excellent Theophilus. Now, what's important about this is Theophilus, he says, most excellent Theophilus, that's actually a title for a Roman official. So Theophilus, which means lover of God, actually was a Roman official. Many theologians believe that Theophilus was the guy who paid for Luke to travel around the Mediterranean and talk to these eyewitnesses. He was either a seeker or a new believer. They're not sure, but he was an outsider. He was a Roman. So he's a Roman citizen who wanted to understand who Jesus was and do I really fit? Do I really belong? Can I be a part of the people of God? But here's the most important thing about Theophilus. Theophilus had a lot to lose. By the early 60s, if you know history, Christians were being extremely persecuted, especially in Rome. He was a Roman citizen. He could have lost his business, his property, his safety. I mean, it, he had skin in the game if he became a believer, if he went public. And so for him, he would have to be certain. And this word certain isn't just this idea that you would know all of the information. You know the 10 arguments for the resurrection, or you'd know. It's not just knowing the information. It's a, it's a much more powerful Greek word. Um, the Greek word has the idea that you, this would become bedrock truth in your life, that you would be able to lean back on this truth, that you'd be willing to step out in faith on this truth, that, you, that this would change your life. It's that kind of truth. So... Luke is saying, I investigated it carefully. I talked to eyewitnesses. I put together an orderly account because I understand, Theophilus, that you have a lot at stake. Theophilus might even have paid for this book. And so he's saying, I understand you want to know this. And he goes, because this is going to cost you something to be a follower of Jesus and, you know, in, in your business, in your life or something. So you need to know. 
What I love is Luke doesn't rebuke Theophilus for having some doubts. Because even as he records the story, he's going to tell the story about Thomas. Thomas had doubts that he was an apostle. Remember, Jesus was appearing to the disciples different times and places, and they'd come back and report. And so three or four would see Jesus, and they'd come back. We saw Jesus. We talked with Jesus. We ate with Jesus. And Thomas wasn't there. And he'd go, great, great. And then another group of people would see him, and they'd go, good for you. And finally, he gets so sick of that. I'm done with it. I don't want to hear any more stories of Jesus appearing. I'm not believing it. I can't believe it. I saw him die. Until I can touch his hands, I touch his side, I'm not going to believe and then, of course, Jesus shows up to him shortly after that. And he says, okay, Thomas, here, touch, touch my hands. Put your hands in my side. And then Thomas is overwhelmed and he's convinced of it. And so there's no shame in doubting. In fact, Luke understands that Theophilus will doubt. And so he writes an orderly account, all of this research, so that he can be certain. But what does it mean to move a truth from your head so that you understand information... So that it moves to your heart and you really believe it, but it moves out into your lifestyle so it changes how you live. That's why Luke is writing his book. That's his desire for you, that it will change how you live. Uh, Michael Novak, who's a philosopher, wrote in a book, Three Kinds of Convictions. And I think it's helpful for us to look at them just to think about what does it look like for a thought, you know, for something to be something that moves from your head to your heart out into your life. So he talks about three kinds of convictions. The first is a public conviction. That's what you say. So a perfect example of a public convi conviction is this. Say your spouse walks out and they stand in some kind of new article of clothing and they say, does this make me look fat? And the answer is, right, that's the right answer. You should say no. You should say that 100% of the time. Whether or not you believe it, it's the right thing to say, right? There are a group of people that are employed by us that speak to us this way all the time, and they're called politicians, exactly. <laughs> politicians, all the time, when they're asked a question, they say something, and you look at them, and they go, you don't even believe that. But they're saying something that's politically correct, and that's just the way they speak. They speak publicly, and they'll even say, well, my private, you know, my personal opinion, it doesn't matter, and they just state, you know, what their public opinion is, which is just something that they say. A perfect example of a public uh, conviction is when Herod, the wise men, came through, and they were saying, we're looking for the one born king of the Jews. Herod says, oh, when you find him, tell me where he is so I can come and worship him too. See, that's a public confection. But he had no intention of worshiping Jesus. He wanted to kill Jesus. So that's the idea of a public conviction. Then there is a private conviction. These are things that you think that you think, but when circumstances change, your opinion changes. So I think that I think this, but as circumstances change, I'll change. And so a perfect example of that is when you were dating, you, you thought you loved somebody. You might even have told them that you loved them. But then as things changed... You know, and you broke up, you'd say, I don't, I don't, I don't think I love them. Okay? Things changed. And the perfect example of that in the Bible is Peter. You know, he says, you know, one of you will betray me tonight. Peter looks at Jesus and says, I will never betray you. Did he believe that when he said it? He absolutely believed that. But then the circumstances changed. He got in a situation. Jesus has been beaten. All of a sudden, you know, it's a high octane moment. And he denies Jesus three times. It's something that I think I think, but then when circumstances change, I change. But the third one, which is the most powerful one, is a core conviction. This is where it can be seen in your life. This is a part where you're leaning into it. So, you know, when I was rock climbing, you know, it came this moment. Am I going to, I had a, I believed that the rope would hold me. I would tell you that the rope would hold me. I even thought that the rope would hold me. But there has to be this moment that you lean into, put your whole weight against, and then you trust in it. The one core conviction everyone has in the room is gravity. If I went and watched you in your life, there'd be no doubt you all believe in gravity. You wouldn't go standing up in a high place and just leap off of it. You drive your car based on gravity. You know, you hold things based on gravity. Gravity is a core conviction. So Luke is writing a book and he's saying, I'm not, I'm not interested in your public confession. I don't want you just to say something, right? 
I don't even want you to think something right, although thinking's important. This is about living right. I'm writing a book so that you can live the way that God calls you to live. Understand that? You with me? Because it's only going to get painful from here on out. Okay, really? You understand? Okay, flip over your outlines. Do you know what the Apostles' Creed is? The Apostles' Creed has been for thousands of years. I mean, it might be 2,000 years old. The statement that churches literally recited, it was their way of memorizing theology. It has been around forever. Uh, you might have grown up in a liturgical church and they actually repeated this out loud. Um, so I'm going to read it to you. You want to read it? You can read it with me. All right, we're going to read it. I'll let you read it with me. But here, it says the Holy Catholic Church, which means universal church, right? So that's not the Catholic Church you think of today. The universal church is the worldwide, multi-ethnic, multicultural, worldwide body of Christ. That's what you're affirming that you believe in. So you don't need to glitch there if you, you know, you're not the same Catholic. You understand? All right, so lots of churches for thousands of years. This is what they said. Read it with me. I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. Under Pontius Pilate, he was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. And on the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of the saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. All right. How many of you would say you believe that? Okay. How many of you think that you believe that? Okay. Now, here's my real question. Suppose that we had somebody follow you for a whole year of your life. And they watched what you said, and they were able to understand what you thought, and they observed your life. Would that be the creed that they would write? I don't think so, all right? I wrote another creed for you because I've watched your life. And I'm going to read this creed for you. And this is probably, you, you just pick the ones that would be mostly your creed, all right? I believe sometimes lying is necessary to avoid discomfort. I believe if I don't get what I want in my marriage, I can look elsewhere for fulfillment. Much more pain in that one. I believe I should be especially nice to people who are in a position to help me with their wealth, status, power, and influence. I believe I have a right to punish or get even with anyone who hurts me. I believe if I follow religious rules, God loves me more. I believe it's okay to gossip about people. I believe it's up to me to get the life I want. All thing comes to he who waiteth if he worketh like hell while he waiteth. <laughs> who said that? It's not a biblical verse. Winston Churchill said that. I believe I deserve a reward for being good and that God owes me pleasure, happiness, perfect children, a problem-free life, and a beautiful spouse. I believe my money is my money and that more money will make my life better. And everybody in Orange County said, yeah. I believe I should have the last word. I believe a little lust, flirting, and indulging doesn't hurt anyone. Now, all of these are destructive to your soul. Now, all of these are written because the sad truth is, if somebody looked at your life, there's a number of them that are true about them. And so here's my question. What turns the Apostles' Creed into your creed? I mean, how does that really become a lifestyle? You know, where you say, I believe in the resurrection of the dead. So that, that means is you're not afraid of death. You don't live clutching onto this world and the stuff of this world. If you really believe there's a resurrection of the dead, you wouldn't believe. I mean, how do you, you know, how does that change? I mean, how does that work in life? How does it become a core conviction in your life? Now, I think most of you would say, well, you know, I want to I follow God. 
I want to do what Jesus says. I just want to know for sure before I step out. But what I'm going to show you is that you can't know for sure before you step out. In fact, what Jesus says over and over again is you can't know some things on this side. You're going to have to step out and obey him, and then you're going to learn some things over here that you can never know over here. You'll never know them. That is what faith is all about. And that's why Luke wrote his book, to help you move from here to here. But you have to understand, this takes faith, and faith is not sight. And so you have to lean back. You have to trust in when everything in your whole mind is going, don't do that, don't do that, don't go, go back, go back, go back. So look at what Jesus said in John 17, 7, 17. Anyone who chooses to do the will of God, all right? So what's the first step? You have to choose. First, so you have to choose to do the will of God, and then what happens? They'll find out whether my teaching comes from God or whether I speak on my own. The only way you're going to know that what Jesus says is true is when you choose to obey it. You'll never know on this side. i got to know for certain before I do it. I can't lean back. I'm not going to step out. I'm not going to trust. You'll never know that what God says is true, what Jesus says is true, until you step out. You just never know on this side. Look at He says, anyone, the next one in John 8. To the Jews who have believed in him, Jesus said, if you hold to my teaching, you are really my disciple, a follower. So what's a follower? Somebody holds to Jesus' teaching. And hold there means they live on it, they base their life on it. You can see it lived out in their life. And he says, then. So what do you first have to do? Hold, live, trust in, live like what Jesus said is true. Then you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. You see, you want to know the truth. You want to be set free from the truth. But it doesn't come by intellectual pursuit. And that's important, and you should do it. You can learn every truth about the Bible, but that won't change. You have to step out on these truths. You've got to believe. You've got to lean back when you think, oh, no, this could go really bad. But the problem is, is that for many of us, faith and the things of God's Word are great theory. They're just not a reality in our life. What I mean by that is this. Lots of you have a theory about forgiveness. You understand that the Bible teaches forgiveness? You understand that Jesus is a forgiver. You understand that Jesus even says that he expects you to be a forgiver because he's forgiven you. You have all of the theory. The problem is you've never put it into practice because somebody hurt you and you resent them. And if I knew their story, you, were, you would be sure that I would agree with you, that you have a right to hold that against them and to be angry at them and to be hurt and not to extend forgiveness. It's just a theory. But you're never going to know the wonder of forgiveness until you step out and say, I'm going to let them go. I'm going to release them. Even if they haven't asked for it, even if they don't want it, I'm going to forgive them because that's what Jesus did to me. And when you step out and you do that, it feels like you're losing everything. You're leaning back. You're going, this could really hurt me. They're going to have power over me. This is going to go bad. But when you step out and learn that, here's what you'll know. Jesus really is a forgiveness. Forgiver. His forgiveness means more to you than you could ever imagine. Forgiveness is life transforming and you will discover a freedom in forgiveness that you would never know if it just stays a theory in your life. Lots of you have a theory about generosity. God owns everything. Some of you struggle with the idea that your money is actually God's money and you're trying to figure that out. But some of you even believe that what you have is God's, that God owns everything. That, that God can be trusted with things. But it's all theory to you. You don't give faithfully and regularly and proportionately as God blesses you. You just don't do that. You hold on to everything that is there, everything that you have. And here's what I know. You'll never experience the generosity of God. You'll never understand when Jesus says, give and I will give to you. And it will be pressed down in a full measure and running over. You will live a blessed life like you can't imagine. It's not dollar for dollar. I'm not a vending machine. He goes, but you will understand the generous heart of God. Some of you, it's just theory. And that's all it is. And when you even talk about generosity, your words clank and it doesn't mean anything. But for those of you that live it, it is a whole, you go, I know God is generous. 
I can't believe how generous he is to me. Some of you have a theory about loving your enemies, but you've never really done it. Some of you have a theory about the atonement. You understand that your sins are covered. You can talk about there's on the cross, Jesus covered my sins. But you live with guilt and shame. You're always condemning yourself and you're not free because you've never embraced. It's just a theory. And you've never said, God, I am going to accept deep into my soul that you have forgiven. You don't remember it. I won't remember it. I am going to accept that. But it's just theory. Some of you, it's a theory that God wants you to be a loving person. It's theory. You understand? What does it take to become a loving person? Well, you don't even know. Good you're here today. You find somebody that's hard to love and you love them. All right? That's it. That's how you become a loving person. All right? You understand Jesus' love, but then you just you start loving somebody. So singles, you know, what's the biggest, scariest thing to being married? You're going to marry some broken, sin-filled person. So you live with this idea that there's a, the myth of a perfect mate perfect soulmate there's no perfect soulmate there's just broken people all right pick one that you can love all right <laughs> now lots of you lots of you that are single wait 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 I'm, hold don't lose it and lots of you that are single go no way he's serious about that well you talk to a married person all right because they'll go <laughs> now now those of you that are married you know, lots of you are going <laughs> you know i so married the wrong person all right now when you think that what are you saying so you have a theory about love I'm going to find this perfect person that's going to love me and fulfill me and make my life happy. But that's just theory. What God's word says is, I'm going to, you're going to find an equally broken person. <laughs> Somebody understands this. And, and you're going to come into marriage and what you're going to do is you're going to take the love that I've given you and it's going to so transform you that you're going to step out and you're going to love somebody even when it hurts and it's hard and it's difficult. And when you do that, it's going to transform you and you're going to become a loving person. But you're never going to get there by being selfish and self-centered and going, so you're so the wrong person. You're both so the wrong person. Get over it. And you do it. But it's just theory. And the problem is you'll never understand what Jesus said because it's theory. It's theory that God can tr you can trust him with your time and your business and your family and your talents. It's just theory. And I'll tell you, if you want it to stay theory, stay home for a year. Because we're going to go through the book of Luke and Luke's going to keep punching you in the face with this. Jesus didn't die on the cross. He didn't come and teach you these things so you can keep it theoretical. Luke says, I did not write my book so it can be theoretical. This is a moment where I'm saying to you, Luke's saying, I want you I want your life to be changed. I want you to be certain. I want you to lean back and find the thrill of trusting in Jesus in these things that God will provide. He will protect. You will become a loving person in the most difficult moment. These are the things that are true. But it requires you stepping out. And when you step out, it will change everything. The first time in my life that I really stepped out was when I was in college. And it was uh, plain to me that Jesus was saying to me, I want you to trust me with your career. It was as clear as somebody talking, but I didn't hear words, but I absolutely knew at that moment, Jesus was saying, I want you to trust me with your career. And I said, yes. And the first thing he said was, I want you to be a pastor. And for me, that was kind of surprising because my dad was a pastor and I watched him in a church and I saw the beauty of the church, but I saw the pain of it and I thought, Really, I don't think I'll be good at that. Secondly, pastors, I like to learn, but I don't just love to study, and pastors have to study a lot. Um, I like making money. Pastors don't make a lot of money. And the biggest thing is pastors are nice and compassionate. <laughs> and so I said, okay, I said I'd do anything, but Jesus, really, pastor? So I started being a youth pastor, and... I'll tell you, it just was amazing to me how God used me as a youth pastor. And I never would have chose that. I was amazed. I mean, I, it was like I was made to do that. And then I came to Mariners as a college pastor, and everything was like awesome for two years. And then uh, the church went through four years of decline and three pastors in a row. And for all four of those years, 
I started to say, God, it's time for me to leave. I want to leave. And Jesus kept saying, stay. And I said, do you see what's going on? I want to leave. He said, stay. I had opportunities to leave. I go, this is an opportunity. God, this is an opportunity. And I, but I said, God, because what did I say in college? Whatever you want, my career, wherever you want me to go, whatever you want me to do, it's your decision. So I'm going, it's time to go. No, stay. No, no, it's time to go. Stay. Then Mariners was down to about 200 people, fourth year. And the board came to me and they said, I want, we want you to be the senior pastor. And without thinking, I said, no. Now, I wanted to be a senior pastor at this time. I just didn't want to be the senior pastor at Mariners. And so I was looking to be senior pastor someplace else, and I just said no. And, and then I hung up. And right after I hung up, there was like a thunderbolt in my heart. And Jesus was, he said, are you going to talk to me about this? <laughs> and so I did. And then I had to say, because he says, I want you to become the senior pastor at Mariners. Because when I was in college, I made a life-changing decision where I said, whatever you want, wherever you want, whenever you want, my career is in your hands. On this side of that decision, it's emotional for me because of what I know on this side. I know that God is infinitely wise. I learned things in the four hard years when I wanted to leave that have served me for the whole rest of my career. I've got to be with you on this great adventure. I would have missed all of that. I mean, all of the things I've seen, God's faithfulness and his love, and he knew the future when I didn't know the future because I trusted him. Why would you be so foolish to not trust him, to step out, to lean back, even when it seems counterintuitive and you're going, this could go wrong, it could go wrong, it could go wrong, it could go wrong. But what are you going to trust and believe? What are you going to bet your one and only life in? Luke says, I've written a book for you from an outsider's perspective that says, I've written it so that you can be certain that Jesus is who he says he is and you can bet your one and only life this is the truth. Would you bow your heads and close your eyes? What is the one thing Jesus wants from you? I believe that there's a number of people that this week are going to face a defining moment. And you're literally standing at the edge And you're deciding whether or not you're going to lean into what Jesus has said and trust in and hold on to or you're going to move towards what you think is safety. What is it that he wants from you this week? This is the most important question, and this is why you came to church today. It's not an accident that you're here. And God's speaking to your heart. What would it look like for you this week to lean on Jesus, to trust in Jesus, to step out in a way that he's called you to? What would that look like this week? What's he's asking from you? What would it look like for you to step out? For some of you that are seekers, maybe it's just reading the book of Luke, saying, I want to know who you are, Jesus. I feel like you're asking me to know you. For some of you, who've been walking with him, but it's grown stale. Saying, I need to read the book of Luke because I need to understand it for some of you that are at a pivotal moment. I know what to do, Jesus. Would you just give me the courage to step out and to do it? What would it look like this week for you to do what Jesus wants you to do? Father, here we are as your children. Would you speak to us? As you call us, would you give us 
first the desire to do what it is that you've called us to do. And then would you give us the grace, the help, the power, the strength to do the very thing that you want us to do. We can only know the truth and be set free as we're willing to step out in faith. God, give us the courage to step out. Would you join me in singing a prayer? Let's stand together and sing this prayer together.